Dana Hollinger. Here. Margaret Brown. Here. Matthew Sehoff for John Chung. Here. Richard Costigan. Here. Priya Mother. Bill Slayton. I think he's in back, but. Ellen LaFasso for Betty Yee. Here. Oh, and please note Bill Slayton just joined. First order of business is approval of the sem September 25th, 2018 Risk and Audit Committee agenda. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Moved by Brown, seconded by Mother. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Next item is the executive report, and I call on um, Marlene Timber Timberlake Diadamo. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Madam Chair, committee members, Marlene Timberlake Diadamo, CalPERS team member. Today you have one action item before you, the Office of Audit Services Charter Update. This item is mandated by the International Standards for the Professional Practice of Internal Auditing and requires the Chief Auditor to periodically review the Internal Audit Charter and present to the Board for approval. In addition, uh, Enterprise Compliance will present the 2017-18 Annual Compliance Report as an information item. This item highlights activities and accomplishments for the fiscal year and the information is within and included in the CAFR. Lastly, Enterprise Risk Management will present the suggested tolerance levels for the strategic risk measures. These measures will monitor the degree of risk CalPERS is prepared to accept for each measure based on the board's risk appetite. The next, the next Risk and Audit Committee meeting is scheduled for November 14, 2018 here in Sacramento and includes the Independent Auditor's Report, the review of the Independent Auditor's Management Letter, the finalist selection for the independent financial statement auditor and the enterprise risk management framework review. Thank you, Madam Chair. This concludes my report and I would be happy to take any questions. Um, seeing no questions, uh, do I have a motion to approve the June 20th, 2018 Risk and Audit Committee meeting? Minutes. Okay, moved by Mother, second by Costigan. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Uh, item five is information and consent items, and I've had no request to take anything off the calendar. So we move to six, which is an action agenda item. And uh, Ms. Chapui, could you please give us the Chief Office of Audit Services Charter Update? Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Belize Chapui, Office of Audit Services. Agenda item 6A is an action item. Staff is requesting the Risk and Audit Committee to approve Office of Audit Services Charter Update. The International Standards for Professional Practice of Internal, audit, in, internal Auditing require the Chief Auditor to periodically review the Internal Audit Charter and present to senior management and the board for approval. The current Office of Audit Services Charter was reviewed and approved by the Finance Committee in November 2011. The audit charter documents the purpose, authority, and the responsibility of CalPERS internal audit activity. The charter also establishes the internal audit activity's position within the organization, including the nature of chief auditor's functional reporting relationship with the board, authorizes access to records, personnel, and physical properties relevant to the performance of engagements, and defines the scope of internal audit activities. The proposed updates are minor in nature and are intended to further clarify the sections of professionalism, independence, scope of work, responsibility, reporting, and monitoring. The red line version of, of um, the, uh, the charter was included as an attachment to the agenda item. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Ms. Mother. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question on page three of the um, of the draft of the revised charter, uh, and I'm looking at uh, attachment six a att attachment two page three of six, um, the red line in the first chap the first paragraph, the last sentence. The chief auditor shall have no roles or resp and or responsibilities that fall outside of internal auditing. However, if the chief auditor is asked to take on a role and or responsibility outside of internal auditing, safeguards will be established to limit impairments to independence or objectivity. This is new language, and I 
can appreciate the, that I, as I believe maybe you can sh share the intent is to ensure is to ensure independence and um, not uh, for, in objectivity. Um, so, but maybe you can speak a little bit to the addition of this language. Sure. When yep. we were updating the current charter, we followed the standards. So there was a suggested language in, to include in the charter. We followed the suggested language and we compared it to our existing charter and we added the things that weren't there. So it's pretty much following what the standards and best practices require us to do. In the industry. Correct. <clears throat> so I know that we have a culture at CalPERS of sort of cross-enterprise collaboration and um, and that is a generally a positive thing. Um, of course, with respect to the internal auditor, you, of course, do, the chief auditor, you definitely want this independence and this objectivity. So I guess my question is, um, you know, the first sentence and the second sentence seem a little bit at odds in that it's, it's an absolute statement. The first statement is that there will, shall be no roles or responsibilities. And then the second is that if you're asked to, that you may, but you have to try to pr preserve, you know, limit impairments. So maybe it shouldn't be quite so absolute, the first sentence, but as a general rule, the chief auditor shall have no ro roles or responsibilities or, or uh, Oh, you know, it's, it's, you know, they seem a little bit contradictory. Right. So in general, the auditor should not take any operational role in the organization. However, sure. because of the knowledge and expertise that we also possess in our office, we're right. sometimes expected to sit on committees as a, con, you know, as a consultant in an advisory role. And it also helps us to follow the progress and operations within the organization. So in s on several committees that I sit on, I'm an advisory member. I don't vote on actions. I can't sure. be part part of the decisions that they take. However, it's also for me to be involved and follow um, the operations. So so I think there could be some language that we should we add to make it a little bit less absolute um, uh, or, or maybe some maybe sh uh, should articulate that it's it, it would be only in a consultative or advisory capacity, never in a decision making operational capacity. I think it needs a little bit more clarification because obviously your your knowledge and expertise is valuable to this organization beyond yeah. just the performance of the audits. Yeah. Uh, but as you say, obviously you can't be a party to a decision that then your office is auditing. Mm -hmm. That is mm -hmm. that must be prohibited. So I, I think somehow the language doesn't quite little get little. there, sure. and I'm afraid I don't have perfect language to offer. Okay, we um, can work on it. Thank you, Miss Brown. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm on uh, that same page, um, but my question is with the first uh, change in the red line, which says that internal auditors will remain free from interference by any element in the organization, and then you say uh, that threaten your ability to carry out internal audit responsibilities in an unbiased manner. So uh, what type of interference would you have that wouldn't? cause you to, would, that wouldn't threaten your ability. I'm just trying to figure out what are those interferences that we're talking about here. This is to, if, if any interference that could preclude me from um, performing my duties and responsibilities and losing my independence, so I cannot just um, come up with a scenario right now, and this is more to memorize it in case something comes up, then I can just pull the charter up and say this would interfere with my independence and I have to um, refrain from performing these duties. So it, it's more like, I guess, a fail safe if something should happen. That yeah, it, it just says that threaten to carry out your internal audit. I, I'm just trying to figure out, well, what interference would there be? I, I just don't know why we would need to add the, the additional thing, I, just free from interference by any element in the organization. Um, anyways, I, I just didn't know what other interference there would be. These are the languages that we pretty much pulled from the best practices and the standards that the, the So you're just com you're copying the charter? Right. It's not okay. me interjecting or pu in putting this language in here. It's pretty much the recommended language in the charter, so we pretty much copied it from there. So, I'm at, so you, there hasn't been some other interference that's no. going on? No. Okay. Correct. Thank you. Yeah, it's more like if something should happen in the future. Okay. Um, 
Are you done? Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Mr. Slayton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanna go to uh, page three, or excuse me, five of six. And in the internal audit plan, uh, it, it says um, in the middle of the first paragraph, including as appropriate any plan amendments, special tasks or projects requested by management and uh, RAC, th this committee. And then in the next sentence it says, um, the next paragraph, any significant deviation from the, oh, I see, wait a minute. In, um, there's a prioritization based on a risk-based methodology, including input of the executive team and the board. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. trying to understand, is it the board, is it RAC? It's, there seems to be a little bit of a, a conflict there as to who provides input. And here's where I'm trying to get to. The, the more important question is this. Let's say I, as a board member, have an issue that I think warrants internal audit work. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure there's a process for me to raise that mm -hmm. issue, and I would think it would be with this committee, and then this committee would debate that and decide whether to charge you with that responsibility to go look at that particular issue. Am I, do, we, do we have that ability, and if we don't, why not? Yes, you do have that ability. The reason it's documented here in this way, we do during every year in the spring, we go through a risk assessment process to identify those assignments that we would like to conduct in the following fiscal year because right. the universe is huge, the resources are limited, we can't mm -hmm. possibly audit everything every year. Sure. So in doing that, there's three things we do. We also seek input from the board members through surveys. We send an electronic survey to each and every board member. However, you're right, the Risk and Audit Committee is carved out and has delegation from the board to oversee the audit function. Um, the lines there, uh, it's, it's beyond my role and responsibility how the communication could come through the board members to the Risk and Audit Committee and be communicated to me. That could be discussed further. And um, how it, that this sentence just refers to that risk assessment we conduct every year. Okay, so, but you're doing this, you're essentially coming up with an audit plan right. once a year based on your judgment of the risk that we face and the resources that you have, and that's reviewed by us, and then we agree, okay, that's the plan. Right. So now let's fast forward three months, and I've now raised an issue with RAC that I think something needs to be, I'd like something to be looked at, and if the committee agrees, then how do we incorporate that? Absolutely, that could be communicated to us through the Risk and Audit Committee. Whether, if it's a consulting engagement, we already budget uh, hours for consulting engagements just for those needs, like you express, and it, sometimes it comes through the executive team, sometimes it, those requests come through the senior leadership as well. We take those into consideration, and we honor those assignments throughout the fiscal year. Uh, we, we certainly will take those into consideration if okay. there's a need that comes to, but how, if you're asking me how to communicate that through the process, it could be communicated to us and then we'll update it on our quarterly report to say that we are including these assignments okay. on our plan. I, I, I guess what I don't see quite in here, I guess it's implied, but it's not in here specifically that this committee has the delegated authority to okay. uh, essentially require you to look at something. Now, in the other board I'm on, we that board, we do have that ability to do that, to direct the internal auditor to be okay. able to look at something if we as a committee feel it's important enough. Now, I don't know if that then has to go to the board for a decision or whether it's totally delegated here, but what I'm trying to get to is if, as an individual board member, we should not be able to direct you to go look at something as an individual board member. Okay. But as a committee or as a board, we should have that ability to do that if we feel there's something that Certainly. needs to be looked okay. at. Certainly. Okay. You would like us to add in So here? That's, what I'm, that's what I'm looking for here, and I don't quite see it Okay. We can add in it the here. Words. We can add it in here. So what I'm seeing is, um, and I'm not sure if we need a motion for this because this is an action item, Miss. 
Mother's comment to add as on um, agenda item 6A, attachment to three of six, um, as a general rule, the chief auditor shall have no roles and or responsibilities um, to add that language and then to address Mr. Slayton to give the risk and audit committee having a delegated authority to um, direct the internal audit, a chief auditor. Okay. Did, did any, do we need a motion for that or? Okay, does somebody want to make that motion? I don't think. Okay, Ms. Mother. I don't think in this um, charter we can address the delegations of, from the board to the committee. Right. I think that is embedded in the delegation to the committee. So I would extract that from um, what you were okay. outlining. I think if we want to review the delegation, that's something that comes to the committee for review every year, as I recall. And so, um, and we reviewed it, I believe, in March or April. I can't recall exactly, but um, we certainly could look at that. Um, in that regard, but but I appreciate your capturing uh, my comment, and I think um, putting in as a general rule before right. the chief auditor uh, on page three, and then I would say, however, if the chief auditor is asked to take on a, and maybe we should be explicit about it being a consulting or advisory role um, outside of internal auditing. So right, so it should you, be. sort of limp, putting putting a boundary around what kind of role it could be, or right. a, or a non-operational, non-decision maker. I don't know how we can. Um, do you think do you think consulting advisory would yes. would yeah. yep. capture yeah. it? Yeah. Then then I'm happy to make the motion to adopt yes. this with that with that change. I'll okay, and thank you. Okay, so it's um, so made by Mother, seconded by Costigan. All in favor? Wait, 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 wait a minute. I want I want to. Can we discuss the motion just a little bit? So, you're not. Yeah, I'm, I'm on. Oh, I didn't realize. Okay, doesn't. Is that okay, Chair? I just we have a motion in a second. Is that right? Yes, he seconded. I made it, and yeah. Costigan okay. seconded it. So I just, but but the change does not include what I was discussing. It Correct. does not because does not. that's part okay. of the delegation so, from the board to the. But I, here's a, a fix of it because that could the delegation could come later. The issue is whether this board or a committee of this board can direct the internal auditor to look at something. And, and that could be by modifying the words, uh, including input from the executive team and the board, because the board could do this. So in, in, if you change the word input, including direction, if you put change input Okay, this is on page five of six. This is page five. Uh, the, on the internal audit plan. Internal audit plan, last Second paragraph on the page. Got it. And if you change the word input to direction, mm -hmm. then it implies the board can do this. And then later on, if we choose to, if the board wants to delegate that in the delegation to RAC, that's fine. That could be accomplished. But it allows the board to uh, direct the internal auditor to look at something if we feel as a group it needs to be looked at. May I suggest So I would ask if that. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Ms. Chippewa. But if we change that, the word board to RAC, then, then the charter requires the risk and audit committee to direct me if an assignment comes up and then maybe the delegation could be worked on later between the board and the risk and audit committee. Would that help? Well, I, I, could you, I couldn't so really in this, understand in the, what... In the second paragraph, and under internal auditing... Correct. As Bill Slayton suggested, we're going to switch, change the word from including input to including direction from the executive team and the board, it, it, as it reads right oh. now. And I'm suggesting if we change the board um, to a risk and audit committee, would that help? That way, it has to come from the risk and audit committee, and then the board and risk and audit committee work on the direction later. Would that help? Well, I find that would be limiting ex scope okay. from okay. Um, the board to narrowing the scope to just the risk and audit committee, and I'm not sure okay. that um, uh, it, my it's, it's a sequence problem, right? Because right now we don't have that delegated authority. Is that 
the point Ms. Mother, I believe, is making. So if you make it, if, we're, if this is an action item and you make it board, then the board can choose later to delegate it. Um, but I would say it's the, the one other change I would suggest is including direction of the executive team and or the board because the board may want to have you look at something. So it's really an and or. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you leave it board, then it later can be changed to RAC if we choose to as a group. Um, so. Okay, Ms. Moth. So I, if I'm understanding Mr. Slayton's suggestion, it's not so much whether it's the risk and audit committee versus the board, it's Correct. more this word input versus direction. So he, he, I guess, I, th I think what I'm understanding him to say, and for, correct me if I'm incorrect, is that he, he doesn't want you to, the uh, chief auditor to just consider our input in the audit plan, but that if we say we really, we, we direct you to do this, then that, then that you would take it on to the plan. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's maybe really a definitional <laughs> question about the word input and what does that mean. Um, well, direction implies that um, we have delegated authority. Input's just input. Well, I, this, I, this, I is, think. this is during the risk assessment and yes. the preparation of the audit plan. Oh. So we seek input from the board, the executive right. team, the senior leaders, right? We seek input from all the executive team. My, the management my, team, I would say, yeah. everybody, right, overseeing the organization, the board, executive team, and the senior leaders. And then we also factor in our uh, knowledge and expertise and understanding yeah. and then identify those auditable assignments for the year. I mean, ultimately, the board adopts the audit plan. I mean, the, the, the committee makes a recommendation to the board to adopt the audit plan. So in effect, we do direct whether what's included in the audit plan by, by that very action. So I, get, I guess for my view, we don't necessarily need the word direct in here that we provide input, right. you incorporate it, we review it. If we think something's missing, we again provide input, you, you, you amend it and it comes back to us and we ultimately adopt it. So I, I personally think that we could leave the word input and it would still go through its regular process of approval and we would, uh, the board ultimately has the opportunity to determine what is included in that audit plan. Correct, and that would be the audit plan. However, like Bill Slayton said, as, some, as assignments come up or if something comes up throughout the year, we could always take that into consideration and perform that assignment if board directs us to do that. Yeah. In addition to the audit plan, this is just specifically for preparation of the audit for plan. For the audit plan, okay. Well, I, like I said, I just wanna make sure yeah. there's a vehicle for right. if someone has an issue, they bring it before the appropriate body of this board, whether yes. board or committee, mm -hmm. and then there's an ability to have that issue looked at by your team. That's yes. all I'm trying Absolutely. to accomplish. Absolutely. It could so be if directly. we can do it under these words. Yeah, I'm, I think the I'm fairly comfortable that that exists. Okay. All right. Just to, just to close this out, I think the appropriate mechanism is to, if you have a concern, to raise it with the chair, say I'd like to put it on the agenda, and then the chair would work with the team to put to okay. agendize it, and then the committee right. can make a recommendation, and the board yes. can approve it. Okay, yes. I'm fine. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So, um, so Ms. Mother made a motion to approve the charter with uh, the amended language. Mr. Costigan uh, seconded the the motion. So, all those in favor, aye. say aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. So we're now at 7A. Um, oh, I'm, it does, it, for some reason. Sorry, Mr. Jones, but. Okay. You're on. Oh, oh, I just, could you hit it again? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, okay thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I have a request, and I'm not so sure that uh, it's the audit committee that should consider it, or whether it's the governance committee or. Uh, whether it's performance and comp, uh, and that is, is that recently we've had to rely on a, a uh, independent investigation on a number of issues, and I think that uh, we need to have a discussion or consideration about establishing an inspector general position, and I want to um, 
to this committee whether or not this is the appropriate place to bring it back for discussion or whether it's governance and since the president is here she could also opine on that so that's what I would well like it to is say. regarding risk to the system mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm yeah Matt can you tell us the appropriate uh, committee to bring it up it's not crystal clear but I would say it'd probably be governance Ms. Mother, if I, if I, I would just suggest yes, I'm happy to have a conversation with you. It's not on this agenda today, so right. we, we yeah. can't discuss. Yeah, it but I wanted to raise it because I didn't know. I'm trying yeah. to clarification on which is the appropriate committee. Okay. I'm happy to have a conversation with you about okay. it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So now that brings us to uh, 7A, the annual compliance report. Ms. Diadama. Uh, good morning. So this item, 7A, is the annual compliance report. Is it, it is a uh, agenda item that you see every year in September, and then it, sh it uh, gets incorporated into the CAFR as part of the November agenda item. This agenda item is a little bit different this year. We've modified it a bit. We've tried to streamline it and highlight the work of the enterprise compliance branch as well as the embedded compliance liaisons that exist throughout the, the enterprise. The uh, integrated assurance model is something that we talk about a lot and it's highlighted in this, in this uh, document. It incorporates governance, risk, and compliance practices as a multifaceted approach to promote compliance awareness and accountability. Our model fo focuses on the three lines of defense framework, which promotes collaboration and increased understanding of roles and responsibilities. The report highlights different activities within the enterprise compliance branch, focusing on the enterprise compliance monitoring and oversight unit, the enterprise ethical standards and investigations unit, enterprise policy and delegation management, as well as operations, communications, and reporting. In terms of our, our embedded compliance efforts, we've highlighted uh, compliance activities within our health policy and benefits branch, as well as customer services and support the investment office, our operations and technology branch, human resources services, and our operations support services. What you'll see from this document is that enterprise compliance works very closely with many of the divisions within the enterprise, and we're focused on uh, getting to our the conclusion of our five-year plan, which goes through 2020. At this point, I can stop and take any questions if you have on the report. Seeing none, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Mother. So, sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, I, I'm so thrilled to see the culture of compliance front and center. <laughs> uh, we've talked about that before, but I think that is, um, that is important. I, I did want to ask, uh, you know, obviously we have embedded compliance officers in, in the various divisions and branches, um, as well as your compliance team, mm -hmm. standalone compliance team. And you talked about on page, um, six of 14 of the report that you, uh, th about the embedded compliance program partnered with embedded compliance liaisons to strengthen compliance controls, oversight, and awareness. And I'm just wondering if you could give a little bit more color to that um, and, and what does that look like? How do you ensure that there's good communication between your standalone team and the embedded compliance officers and, um, and how that, that works in practice? Sure. So the three lines of defense model is a model that exists where the first line is essentially your program areas. It's really where your compliance and your risk activities take place. They actually own the compliance and the risk that happens within those programs. Your second line of defense is essentially your oversight team, which is us and others. There's a, quite a few branches or divisions within uh, CalPERS that are second line of defense. And the role of second line is really to provide assurance that the first line is doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. It's almost like a, a trust but verify sort of model. Mm -hmm. And then the third line is actually your audit group. And so when you have your programs, your second line, and your audit, you put together what looks like a framework of three lines of defense where there's work that's being done, there's oversight and monitoring, and then there's the validation that occurs within your audit your audit department. And it really is a circular sort of thing. We uh, actually um, 
engage in our enterprise and our integrated assurance group where we have a lot of the groups in second and third line where we get together and we really go over what's happening within the, the enterprise. We're making sure that we're not duplicating work. We're making sure that we're really connected with what's happening with the program areas. And then within the embedded compliance liaisons, Enterprise Compliance works with those team members. They're designated individuals within the program areas that I've listed here where they're charged with responsibilities of helping to build their individual compliance programs, where they're helping us with training, they're doing some monitoring, they're really working with them to make sure that we can assure ourselves that the work that's being done at that first level is actually being done. And that's really how they work together in terms of first line and second line. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. I wanted to really applaud the team, and as you know, risk is near and dear to my heart, so I really appreciate this three lines of defense and that we have those checks and balances uh, really uh, strengthening the governance and the compliance and risk within the organization, so thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, seeing no further questions, uh, 7B, Strategic Risk me Measure Tolerances, Mr. Grimes. Good morning, Madam Chair, committee members, board members, thank you for attending. Uh, Forrest Grimes, CalPERS team. Today, really, this is a continuation of our June conversation when we talked about uh, strategic risk measures. And today we're gonna present risk tolerances for each of the risk measures. Um, this describes how much uncertainty the board is willing to accept for each of the enterprise risks. And if you, would mi if you wouldn't mind turning to page 88 in your board books. This is really the attachment that lays out the thresholds. Um, the tolerances rather, and the tolerances are very similar to the thresholds that you're very familiar with uh, through the enterprise performance reporting side. Um, and with that, what I'd like to do is really just to stop and ask you if you have questions on the content or methodology of any of the um, tolerances that we've selected. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, I appreciate that. Just a, a question, I noticed, um, well, obviously we don't have the current status on, on this, these reports filled in. When can we, what's the timeline for I'm that? So, I'm so pleased that you asked that. Um, <laughs> we plan on bringing those, we plan on, if you like these, um, these tolerances, what the risk team will do is we'll start collecting data based on this right. information. And then we will bring back to you in February at the Risk and Audit Committee um, in our semi-annual update, um, basically what we would propose to be, what type of reports you're gonna see and the timing of those reports. I can assure you that we're having uh, pretty detailed conversations with um, the uh, within the enterprise regarding how do these performance and risk measures really integrate and how should we be reporting them to you? And right. so what I think we'll be giving that some you know, ongoing thought and debate between now and February and then come back to you with a recommendation. No, I, I appreciate that and I, I really like the risk tolerance um, that you set out and obviously um, uh, the, um, the unfunded liability and the focus, uh, I, I applaud you, so thank you. Uh, Ms. Mother. Thank you. Uh, so I just wanna, if we can just review for a moment, um, the Certainly. risk tolerance um, row, where it has attention required, monitoring required, managed appropriately, those percentages yes. are the probability of the event that's listed in the top row occurring, right? So for example, in the column two, per funding levels below 50%, atten attention is required, would be required if the probability of that occurring was greater than 20%. Exactly, so. and I think when you said probability, you hit on really the key term because the actuaries will be calculating that, and it's really that probability of that event right. occurring that we're gonna be focused on. And I might you know, just um, add that you saw these as performance measures previously, and I think that, w you know, I think it was July at the offsite that really the um, performance team really was kind of telling you that we're moving this to the risk side. Right. And I think that you can see that those are 
those are truly leading indicators of potential funding um, risk. So I think they're in the right place right now, um, okay, and great. and we're just really you know following up on that to move them over to the risk side. I appreciate that. Um, you know, of course, these three these are clearly key risks for for CalPERS. Yes, and they are in some ways interrelated, and perhaps in some senses the res the the s solutions to resolving one or the other of them might be in conflict with the other so for example to address um a funding level uh, the, the probability of a funding level uh below 50 percent might require an increase in employer contribution so it could Im create it could impact the other two r risks components well absolutely and i want to take you back to late 2017 when really the the full board contemplated the alm cycle and really discussed those really you know opposing risks in in many cases and that's really where we resolve that and where you resolve that is to really kind of look at those two opposing sides and determine what the right balance is yeah exactly terrific well i think this is good work thank you so much Thank you. Um, seeing no further questions, uh, we're on 7C, Summary of Committee Direction. Ms. Diodamo. Yes, uh, the only direction that I have was the conversation around the audit services charter, and I think that right. was pretty well defined. So that was all I have for committee direction. And those were my directions as well, or, or my notes as well. Okay, so the risk and audit committee is the, the is open session. Is, is there anything comment. else? Nope, I just didn't know if there no was any public, public comment. comment. No, I have gotten no requests to speak. So the, anybody out have a request to speak that has not put it in? Okay, so the open session is now closed and uh, we will adjourn in five minutes for a closed session. Thank you. Thank you.